The comb is a remarkably old tool. The truth is, we don't know how long people have been using them for, only that as far back as 5,000 years ago, they were in use. Since some of the earliest designs, the comb has rarely changed, though the material which they were made from did, constantly. They were made with whatever was readily available, including bones, shells, ivory, rubber, iron, wood, lead, porcelain, and so much more. But in the late 19th century, the comb would be made from a new type of material that would change the world forever. Plastic. So take a moment to look at all the plastic around you as we learn something new. The word plastic is derived from the Greek verb plasin, which means to mold or shape, an apt name for the material that is remarkably good at being shaped into pretty much whatever we want, whether that's toys, cutlery, or even a comb. These days, when lab synthesized plastics have virtually defined our way of life, we've come to think of plastics as unnatural. Yet nature has been creating these flexible polymers since the beginning of life itself. Plant cellulose was the raw material for the earliest plastics, but most of today's plastics are made of hydrocarbon molecules, packets of carbon and hydrogen derived from the refining of oil and natural gas. Depending on how it's processed, the plastic can be used to wrap a sandwich or tether an astronaut during a walk in deep space. But believe it or not, the first plastics came from a far better place than you might think. The New York Times is a remarkably old newspaper, having been founded in 1851, but just 16 years later, they would write an article which may sound familiar. It said that elephants were in grave danger of being numbered with extinct species because of humans' insatiable demand for the ivory in their tusks. Ivory, at the time, was used for all manner of things, from button hooks to boxes, piano keys to combs. But one of the biggest uses was for billiard balls, Billiards had come to captivate the wealthy in the United States, as well as in Europe. Every estate, every mansion, had a billiards table. And by the mid-1800s, there was a growing concern that there would soon be no more elephants left to keep the game table stocked with balls. The situation was most dire in Ceylon, the source of the ivory that made the best billiard balls. There, in the northern part of the island, the Times reported Upon the reward of a few shillings per head being offered by the authorities, 3,500 elephants were dispatched in less than three years by the natives. All told, at least one million pounds of ivory were consumed each year, sparking fears of a looming ivory shortage. Yet, ivory wasn't the only item in nature's vast stores that was starting to run low. The hawksbill turtle had become the unwilling supplier of the shell used to fashion combs, and it was becoming scarcer with every year. Even cattle horns, which had been used by American comb makers since before the Revolutionary War, were becoming less available as ranchers stopped dehorning their cattle. So when a New York billiard supplier ran a newspaper ad offering a handsome fortune of $10,000 in gold to anyone who could come up with a suitable alternative for ivory, John Wesley Hyatt, a young journeyman printer in upstate New York, read the ad and decided he just might be able to do it. He had no formal training in chemistry, but he did have a knack for invention, having patented a knife sharpener at the age of 23. Setting up a shack behind his home, he began experimenting with various combinations of solvents in a doughy mixture of nitric acid and cotton. As a side note, that nitric acid-cotton combination called gun cotton was dangerous to work with because it was highly flammable and could even be explosive. For a while, it was used as a substitute for gunpowder until producers of it got tired of having their factories blow up. Remember that point for later. As Hyatt worked in his homemade lab, he was building on decades of invention and innovation that had been spurred not only by the limited quantities of natural materials, but also by their physical limitations. The Victorian era was fascinated with natural plastics, such as rubber and shellac, as they saw in these substances the first hints of ways to transcend the rigid limits of wood and iron and glass. Here were materials that were malleable, but also amendable, to be hardened into a final manufactured form. In an era already being rapidly transformed by industrialization, that was quite an alluring combination of qualities. But Hyatt's breakthrough wouldn't come until 1869, however. After years of trial and error, he ran an experiment that yielded a whitish material that had the consistency of shoe leather, but the capacity to do so much more. This was a malleable substance that could be made as hard as horn. It shrugged off water and oils, 
It could be molded into a shape or pressed paper thin and then cut or sawed into usable forms. It was created from a natural polymer, the cellulose in the cotton, but had a versatility none of the known natural plastics possessed. Hyatt's brother, Isaiah, dubbed the new material celluloid, meaning like cellulose. While celluloid would prove a wonderful substitute for ivory, Hyatt apparently never collected the $10,000 prize. Though perhaps, that's because this early form of celluloid didn't make very good billiard balls. It lacked the bounce and resiliency of ivory, and it was highly volatile. The first balls Hyatt made produced an extremely loud cracking sound whenever they knocked into each other. One Colorado saloon keeper wrote Hyatt saying that, not that he minded, but every time the balls collided, every man in the room pulled a gun. However, the celluloid was an ideal material for combs. As Hyatt noted in one of his early patents, celluloid transcended the deficiencies that plagued many traditional comb materials. When it got wet, it didn't get slimy like wood, or corrode like metal. It didn't turn brittle like rubber, or become cracked and discolored like natural ivory. Obviously, none of the other materials would produce a comb possessing the many excellent qualities and inherent superiorities of a comb made of celluloid. And while it was sturdier and steadier than most natural materials, it could, with effort, be made to look like many of them. Celluloid could be created with the rich, creamy hues and striations of the finest tusks from Ceylon, which allowed it to be marketed as French ivory despite containing none of the elephant-derived materials. It could be dyed in browns and ambers to emulate the tortoise shell, traced with veining to look like marble, or it could be blackened to look like ebony. Celluloid made it possible to produce counterfeits so exact that they deceived even the eye of the expert, as Hyatt's company boasted in one pamphlet, while another one stated, As petroleum came to the relief of the whale, so has celluloid given the elephant, the tortoise, and the coral insect a respite in their native haunts, and it will no longer be necessary to ransack the earth in pursuit of substances which are constantly growing scarcer. Celluloid appeared at a time when the country was changing from an agrarian economy to an industrial one, where at one time people had grown and prepared their own food and made their own clothes. Increasingly, they were eating, drinking, wearing, and using things that came from factories. The US was fast on its way to becoming a country of consumers. Celluloid was the first of the new materials that would level the playing field for consumption. By replacing materials that were hard to find or expensive to process, celluloid allowed the forming middle class to flaunt objects like the wealthy had been doing for centuries. Ample supplies of celluloid allowed manufacturers to keep up with rapidly rising demand while also keeping costs down. Although, for all its significance, celluloid actually had a fairly modest place in the material world of the early 20th century limited mainly to novelties and small decorative and utilitarian items, like the comb. Making things from celluloid was a labor-intensive process. Combs were molded in small batches and still had to be sawed and polished by hand. And because the material was so volatile, the factories were often playing with fire. Workers were often doused under a constant spray of water, but fires were still common. It wasn't until the development of more cooperative polymers that plastics truly began to transform the look, feel, and quality of our lives. By the 1940s, we had both the plastics and the machines to mass-produce plastic products. A single machine equipped with a mold containing multiple cavities could pop out 10 fully formed combs in less than a minute. But unfortunately, that's all the time I have for this video. In a future video, I'll be exploring the next stage of the plastics evolution, moving away from the more natural forms and into the petroleum-based plastics that have transformed how we consume goods. Thanks for watching. If you made it this far, it would mean a lot if you would leave a like on the video and subscribe so you don't miss out on the next one. Thanks again, and I will see you next time.